This is certainly the most detailed video I have done so far. So before I delve into the topic of this video, I want to be clear that this video will mainly be investigating the medicalizing of society from a social science perspective. I am not necessarily trying to send a message about morality. My aim is simply to inform you. The aim is to highlight how those with authority dictate our perception on what is normal and abnormal behavior and what kind of impact our understanding of these things have on children. Over the past 50 years, there has been a significant increase in the number of diagnoses of mental disorders, with many being treated medically. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also known as DSM, have been revised many times over the years. This is a manual that functions as a guide for doctors, psychiatrists, and psychologists when it comes to diagnosing patients. The DSM gives an understanding of disease at a current period of time. So, our understanding of what constitutes disease may thus change from one generation to another. From DSM-1 to DSM version 4, the number of types of diagnosis increased from 100 to 300. Today, 7% of the United States population is dependent upon psychotropic drugs, which act on the central nervous system and alter the function of the brain, leading to temporary changes in perception, mood, consciousness, and behavior. As the market for psychotropic drugs for adults approached a saturation point, children became an important target for the pharmaceutical industry. Children are a perfect target group for medicine, as they can be customers for a long time due to the fact that they have a long life of consumption in front of them. Three epidemics within psychiatry, namely ADHD, autism, and bipolar disorder, will be discussed in this video. One theory that tries to make sense of our medicalized society explains this phenomena by pointing out that the increase in mental illness is due to living in a demanding society, which makes it difficult to be normal in a society that makes us crazy. However, this theory is not that credible, as life has been far more demanding for the vast majority of people throughout history than it is today. Another theory points to environmental factors, like being in a social circle that consumes alcohol and illegal drugs. Both alcohol and narcotic drugs can affect the brain in a way that has great similarities with parts of the symptom picture for a variety of mental disorders. However, the use and abuse of such drugs can only explain a small percentage of the increase in diagnosed mental illnesses that has taken place. And thus, this theory is not that credible either. A third theory is that we are not sicker now than we were before, but we are simply much better at identifying disease. Better diagnostic techniques make it possible to capture more patients who previously went under the radar. This means that, although the new diagnostic techniques can capture someone who was previously not captured, the danger is at least as great that you also capture people who hardly have a mental illness. Today, we may have narrowed our view of normality to an impossible degree. This comes to light, among other things, when we describe what it means to have good health. The most authoritative definition available, the one used by the World Health Organization, defines good health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of illness or infirmity. According to this statement, in order to have good health, it is not enough to be healthy. You must also feel complete physical, mental and social well-being. This highlights that the boundary between normality and mental illness is far from clear and anyone can both feel sick and be diagnosed as sick 
after such a narrow understanding of what it means to have good health. The media isn't innocent in all of this either. Publications in the media and on the internet can help drive forward a diagnostic inflation, such as articles or news posts that says that many people have a specific diagnosis, such as the diagnosis in the autism spectrum. Examples include actor Daryl Hannah, singer Susan Boyle, filmmaker Steven Spielberg, and the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates. During the post-war period, new psychotropic drugs have appeared on the market, many of which are probably less dangerous than those medicines that existed before, especially in terms of side effects and the risk of death by overdosing. The marketing of medicines has been closely linked to the marketing of new diagnoses or a weakening of the diagnostic criteria for many mental disorders, which in particular the revisions of the DSM have stood for. When a new and less dangerous drug is on the market, the pharmaceutical industry often looks for new users and user groups for the drug. This is especially apparent when the use reaches a saturation point within the diagnostic group for which the drug was originally intended. Robert Whittaker, a psychiatrist, believes that the theory of mental disorders caused by a chemical imbalance in signal substances in the brain no longer holds up inside the academic community as before. This theory stated that depression is caused by malabsorption of serotonin, while psychosis, like schizophrenia, is due to imbalance in dopamine absorption. Too much dopamine makes it difficult for the brain to handle the increased number of experiences and emotions that the river of signal substances brings with it. By blocking the absorption of dopamine so that there is a regulated amount of this transmitter substance, it also reduces the amount of electrical impulses. This stabilizes the psyche of the individual. The fourth edition of the DSM system was launched in 1994 with the main objective of improving the accuracy of the diagnostic criteria for diagnosis. The psychiatrists behind the DSM-4 laid the foundation for three new epidemics in psychiatry, even though this was not necessarily their intention. The epidemics I am talking about is the overdiagnosis of conditions such as ADHD, autism and bipolar disorders in children. What happened with the publication of the new edition of the system was essentially a further narrowing of the understanding of normality, ADHD, one possible explanation for the increase in the number of children with the diagnosis is that the actual incidence of ADHD among children has not increased, but that the understanding of what is normal and abnormal behavior in children and adolescents has changed. There is also other factors that has a great impact on whether a child gets diagnosed with ADHD, and some of these factors goes under the radar. A comprehensive study shows that a child's birth time is an important factor for whether or not a child gets the diagnosis. In the United States, boys who are born late in the year has a 70% risk of getting diagnosed with ADHD compared to those born in January. The trend is the same for girls. This could mean that it is the youngest and thus the most immature and most troubled students who has the greatest chance of getting the diagnosis. Since there is now a treatment for these abnormally troubled children, it makes it easier for parents, teachers and health professionals to diagnose them. These children proves to be a medical gold mine. Parents get to know that the child has a diagnosis, which makes them relieved because it's not something the parents have done to the child per se. The doctor gets an experience that she's doing something important and right because treating an abnormal child seems like a good act. And the pharmaceutical industry is experiencing a boom in the sale of medicines used to treat these children. As a bonus, the teachers get a quieter class to deal with. New and improved diagnostic criteria and the knowledge about ADHD have led to more children and young people getting correct diagnosis and the help they need, which is a positive. 
But the question remains whether this applies to all or most of those who are now diagnosed. A study from Finland shows that having a mother or father under the age of 20 increases the likelihood of a child being diagnosed with ADHD by 50%. If both parents are under the age of 20, the risk increases by 100%. The examples that highlights the influence birth time has on these children combined with the example of having a young parent under the age of 20, shows how much the social factors play a role, and not just chemical imbalances. Yoko Nomura, a professor of psychology at the University of New York, believes that doubling in risk is primarily due to environment. Young parents, less often than those who are a little older, may not be as prepared to give their children the upbringing they need which can put their children at risk. With today's understanding of ADHD as primarily a biochemical disease, these children may be treated with medication, rather than focusing attention and treatment on the growing environment and the young parents' lack of knowledge and experience about how children should and should not be treated. The frequency in the use of the diagnosis makes many children and adolescents use stimulating medicines, but it is important to weigh the benefits of using medicines against the disadvantages or problems that the use of medicines bring. The American National Institute of Mental Health has found that, in the long run, it is actually uncertain whether the benefits outweigh the disadvantages of this type of treatment. Some of the literature on children and ADHD raises questions about whether medication treatment beyond two years is beneficial or needed by all children. There may be children who have a pattern of behavior that is so deviant that a psychiatric diagnosis is appropriate. However, there may also be professionals who can easily use the diagnosis of ADHD so that they can medically normalize the behavior of children who are not really abnormal in the psychiatric sense. Autism. The use of the diagnosis of autism has also increased dramatically over the 20 years since the publication of the DSM-4. Previously, autism was a rare diagnosis that was made only on 1 in 2,000 children. Today, 1 in 80 children in the United States is diagnosed, and in South Korea, 1 in 38 children are diagnosed. A contributing factor is Asperger's syndrome. Asperger's syndrome is on the autism spectrum. Asperger's is a diagnosis given to young people who behave unusually, but this is not a behavioral pattern that is as clearly limiting as classical autism. Children with Asperger's have symptoms in the DSM-4 which overlaps with autism, including limited capacity for social interaction, difficulty perceiving social rules and norms, special and limited interests, unwillingness to change the environment and routines, communication and understanding difficulties, and an uneven ability profile. The DSM-4 initiated a false epidemic within the autism spectrum. This has contributed to an increasing proportion of American children being diagnosed with autism. When we examine the symptoms of Asperger's syndrome more closely, we quickly see that it can be challenging to draw a clear line between children who meet the criteria and those who do not. How limited should, for example, the child's capacity for social interaction actually be before we perceive it as abnormal? In the current DSM, Asperger's or the three other diagnoses that form the autism spectrum are no longer separate disease units. Instead, all four are parts of the continuum called autism spectrum disorder. Of course, it is a good thing if the increase in the number of diagnosed people has led to previous undetected cases getting treatment and getting a more tailored training offer within and outside of the school today. But we must not close our eyes to the fact that the fluid criteria for meeting the requirement of autism diagnosis may have led to more people being diagnosed and treated for the disease. In line with our view on ADHD, we may have narrowed our understanding of what is autistic behavior among children. Bipolar disorder. Lastly, we will tackle bipolar disorder. 
which first spread in the United States and has quadrupled over the course of a decade. School employees were concerned about the increase in children showing signs of behavioral disorders, such as oppositional behavior and disrespect for norms and authorities. Some children were initially diagnosed with ADHD and medicated for this disease, but for some, this treatment was not adequate, leading them to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, a diagnosis previously not given to children. When it comes to diagnostic characteristics of bipolar disorders, words such as emotional lability, which means rapid mood swings, euphoria and agitation are used. These words are negatively charged. When describing the so-called normal behavior, words such as emotionality, praise and bold playfulness are used. These are more positively charged words. One question that arises is when a child's unrest turns into bold playfulness, and who decides it? The choice of words used to describe symptoms and normal behavior can be random. But regardless of the word choice, it must be challenging, even for professionals, to draw the boundary between normal behavior and behaviors that are symptoms of an underlying bipolar disorder. It is also difficult to understand that euphoria and agitation is seen as a symptom of mania in children, that, in other words, happy and agitated children should be sick children. A good idea might be to also include the children's age-related behavior and social position when determining the crossing over from normal to abnormal behavior. There is a large research literature on the topic of bipolar disorder in children, but there is no consensus on what is normal behavior. After reviewing 1,100 articles on the subject, Psychiatrist Peter Perry summarizes the situation as intense controversy over the validity of bipolar disorder in children remains, despite a decade and a half of research. The diagnostic criteria for bipolar disorder in the DSM are no longer considered the golden standard for diagnosing children with bipolar disturbance. This is not because they are too wide or catch up too many but because some doctors and the pharmaceutical industry think they are too narrow and capture too few children who need treatment. This has led to an increase in the use of mood stabilizing and antipsychotic drugs, which has significant side effects. Robert Whitaker does not find it strange that the pharmaceutical industry has pushed to expand the diagnostic criteria for this diagnosis. The industry is interested in profits after all, but he believes it is surprising that doctors, teachers, the media, and even parents has also contributed to this. Children on these medicines increased their weight by an average of 6 kilograms in 3 months, with a corresponding increased risk of developing diabetes and other diseases. In the United States, the belief in the usefulness and importance of using the diagnosis of bipolar disorder has gone so far that children down to the age of 2 to 3 are medicated. If this isn't scary enough, Whitaker highlights another important point when it comes to children diagnosed with bipolar disorder. A large proportion of the children described as manic have previously been treated with stimulating drugs that is typical for the treatment of ADHD. He writes that all children who use stimulants, aka are treated medically for ADHD, become a little bipolar, and there is a risk that the ADHD diagnosis will change to the diagnosis of bipolar disorder after some time. To support this claim, a study conducted in Massachusetts found that 11% of children diagnosed with ADHD would develop symptoms of a bipolar disorder within four years, with symptoms that were not present when the diagnosis of ADHD was made. In a country like the US, where around 4 million young people are medically treated with stimulating medications, one can assume that more than 400,000 of them will get the diagnosis of bipolar disorder in their future. However, there is more to this. 
because it is not children and adolescents with previous ADHD diagnosis that make up the largest percentage of those diagnosed with bipolar disorder. The largest group comes from those who have previously been treated for depression. Whitaker believes there are about 2 million American children and adolescents using serotonin absorption inhibitors, also called SSRIs. In the worst case scenario, as many as half of these will later be diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He writes, if 2 million children and adolescents are treated with SSRIs for depression, this practice will create 500,000 to 1 million bipolar youth. Given these figures, it is not unreasonable to describe the diagnosis of children and adolescents with bipolar disorder as an epidemic, at least in the United States. As the research of this video highlights, ADHD, autism, and bipolar disorder are increasingly being used to diagnose children with behavior that parents, teachers, and psychologists perceive as abnormal. Although some children's behavior can clearly reflect the underlying disease, the diagnostic criteria used to make these three diagnoses are so judgmental that the risk of over-diagnosis is present. My question to you is, who do you think is to blame for our overly medicalized society in 2023? Or maybe you don't believe we are overly medicalized at all and I'm just freaking out. Anyhow, let me know in the comments. Also, consider liking and subscribing if you found this video informative and I will see you in the next video.